Good morning, everyone. Uh, it is currently 6.30 a.m. I cannot believe I'm awake at this hour, but here we are. Um, probably not 6.30 where you are unless you are a masochist, but uh, you know, whenever you're watching this. Today we're going to talk about quintillion uh, excerpts from uh, Institutes of Oratory. Particularly, we're going to talk about Quintilian's notion of a good person speaking well, in parentheses, for the public good. Uh, Quintilian says the first two parts without a good person speaking well, and then later rhetors add on to, uh, to that discussion for the public good. Um, why is this important? Why do we need to know this? Well, um, sorry, there's a spider on the wall next to me, so I'm going to have to move. Um, well, because these are the foundations of uh, rhetoric. And when we're talking about rhetoric, and I'm just going to switch this over to a share screen so that um, so that we are all, you know, kind of on the same page. Um, <clears throat> when we're talking about rhetoric, right, we have to keep in mind rhetoric is the art of persuasion, really the art of argument, right? Um, so some of these words we'll see can essentially be used kind of interchangeably. So um, in Quintilian, he says orator, and that is essentially the rhetor, the argue, which is the person arguing, the arguer, um, which today, right, in our classroom specifically, that is the writer. Okay, so when we're talking about rhetoric, right, these terms, you can pretty much just think about them uh, interchangeably. Um, so, and I will use any number, the reason why I'm telling you this is because I will use any number of these terms interchangeably, and so it's important that you know them. So, um, you know, Quintilian talks about the orator, again, the public speaker, because if, as we remember from chapter one, rhetoric comes from the Greek rhetorike, which means public speaking, an orator is a person who speaks pub publicly, um, but the purpose for that oratory is to argue something, right? Um, so that's why kind of rhetor, orator in Quintilian's time means essentially the same thing. Um, the, the arguer, right? The person who is arguing. As we see at the end of Quintilian's speech though, or you know, Quintilian's writing, I should say, it's not a speech, it's a piece of writing, and that's important to note for what I'm going to say next. As we see at the end of this piece of writing, Quintilian says that oratory is essentially the same thing as writing, that writing is, is kind of speech made perfect, right? Um, and so if you have a really great speech, I'm just checking for that spider. Um, if you have a really great speech, uh, when you write it down, it should be just as perfect, if not more so. Um, and when we start to look at the structures of speech and writing with guys like Cicero, who we'll look at uh, in a few days, we'll see that really like the set, the setup of a speech, the structure of a speech is almost identical to the structure of a contemporary thesis driven essay. They're very, very, very similar. So. A lot of times, like students will be like, why do I got to learn this writing? This is stupid, blah, 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 right? Um, again, you're part of this incredibly old, at least, you know, 3,000 year old tradition. So, um, you know, you think like you just found out about thesis statements a few years ago, but we've been doing this in the Western uh, rhetoric tradition for literally millennia, which is wild, right? It's wild if you think about it that way. Like people in ancient Greece were setting up arguments in essentially the same way <laughs> we're setting them up today. Uh, and that's pretty cool, right? Um, that being said, I know Quintilian is tough, right? Because this is translated from, uh, you know, ancient Latin. So uh, it's not gonna be the easiest thing in the world to read but do your best. You don't have to be an expert on Quintilian after this reading. Um, and I've set up some questions to kind of chunk this, you know, these seven or so pages of reading into uh, doable segments. 
So as you'll see here, the questions for understanding that I've set up, these guys right here, they go in order of uh, where you can find them in the piece. So that's going to be helpful in terms of uh, answering them on your own to help you understand this text a little bit better, right? Um, and you should know these, you should know what the answers to these questions are so that, again, you can understand what the heck Quintilian is saying. Um, because you have to know what Quintilian is saying, not only for the next discussion board post, but also for uh, the first essay, the first out of class essay. So it's important that you that you do grapple with this text. Um, so I've, I've set up these questions. The first one is, what are the two things that define an excellent orator? And since this is a tougher text, I kind of gave you that one right off the bat, right? He goes, he kind of launches at the beginning into this diatribe about an orator and all these things and why he's giving this speech that he's giving, or it's not a speech, Professor King, blah, blah, blah. Why he's giving this argument that he's giving. Um, but essentially he comes to the, to the argument that um, an excellent orator, right, is a good person speaking well. And the, the third part, right, for the public good that we'll talk about uh, later, that gets added on a few centuries later, right? So a, an excellent orator to Quintilian is a good person speaking well. And then we add on a few centuries later, a good person speaking well for the public good. Um, so think about what that means. Maybe take a, pause this and take a moment to think about what constitutes a good person? What constitutes a person who can speak or write well? And what is the public good? What does the public good look like? If you think about that, right, that's not going to be the same thing for everyone. Uh, and look at our society today, right? There, there are all different kinds of people who think that the public good is, you know, very different from one another. Um, ask one person to the next what the public good is, and they'll give you a different answer, right? But Quintilian kind of sets up these, these basics, at least, right? And a lot of the times in this writing, he tells you what a thing is by telling you what it's not. So you may be going through some of these paragraphs and going, what the heck? Um, he's doing that for a reason, right? It's, it's kind of, in a way, it's to uh, look at what other people have said. It's also to anticipate counter arguments and naysayers. And it's to really define the parameters, right? Like the field of what constitutes a good orator. Um, so we know the answer to number one, so I'm going to leave the rest up to you. So which does he say, good person speaking well, which one is more important and why, right? Um, why does he discuss so many other people's definitions of a good orator? Why does he mention Virgil's definition, Cicero's definition, Marcus Antonius's definition, Demosthenes definitions? What is he doing? Right? And maybe think about this in terms of your own writing and in terms of responding to research or responding to texts, responding to different arguments. Um, why do you reference other writers? Right? Why do you talk about other thinkers when you're, when you're coming up with your own definitions of things? Right? Um, he then talks about, because a lot of these orators, if we think about oratory, what oratory is, is it's kind of the granddaddy of, of lawyering, of law. Um, these people would, you know, stand in ancient Greece and Rome, they'd stand in front of giant groups of people. A lot of times, uh, uh, you know, democratic councils of, uh, you know, a governing body of a city or village. And they would plead cases. So like, you know, if somebody like stole a goat, right? Or they had to, you know, uh, come up with an irrigation system that worked for the whole city or whatever, right? You'd have to go in front of this governing body and plead your case, not unlike the modern day courtroom, right? So for number four, he talks about the good order having to defend a bad man, right? Essentially the good order is like a defense attorney. Um, he talks about the good order having to defend a guilty man against a tyrant. If we think back to Leith, right? 
we are we are uh, we are in the age of the transition from tyrants to democracy. Um, so, you know, a lot of these people are going to talk about tyranny and why it's not good. Um, and he talks about when the good orator has to lie. Because, you know, if you think about a good person speaking well, right, that person's probably not a liar. That person's probably, uh, you know, not trying to be shady or whatever else you want to call it. But then they also have to sometimes defend people or things that are unsavory. So Quintilian is getting to this kind of murky area, right? The easy stuff is easy, right? To, to just say like, oh, they're perfect and they're always perfect and yada, yada, yada. You know, that doesn't, that doesn't account for a lot of objectivity, right? So he throws in these murky, like, well, what if a good order had to defend a bad person? Oh boy. The beauty that is teaching remotely. Um, Okay, so <clears throat> what's his point in kind of talking about these hypothetical examples? Why does he say, okay, we've got this perfect order, right? This good person speaking well, but let's throw a wrench in the mix. Why, what's his point in kind of doing that? Um, he also talks about hack orators or like not good orators, right? People who are hacks. And if you don't know what a hack is, a hack is a person who kind of like, BS is right who says they're they're good at this thing but they, they're a novice or they're an amateur they're just not as good as they kind of purport themselves to be um so what about hack orators or orators who don't know what they're doing right maybe they bite off more than they can choose so to speak why does Quintilian mention them and what does he say should be done if if one encounters a hack he doesn't say hack because that's like a contemporary term but it's just the best kind of term we can use. Uh, why should we as orators do our research? Like he talks about it in the context of setting up a case, but why is it important that we do our research when we're, when we're setting up our case? Why is it important that we do that? And then finally at the end, like I said, he starts to talk about speech versus writing. And this is especially important, not only when we get to Cicero, but also we think about today, right? Because again, I'm not teaching a speech class. I'm not a comm professor. I'm an English professor. So we start to see the shift, right, from public speaking to writing. And Cicero has something to say about that. What does he say? Um, and, and again, why? So um, again, try to, this, this is a challenging reading. I'm not going to lie. Uh, I like to get it. It won't, it's, it's one of the first, you know, it's one of the oldest readings, so I like to get it out of the way in the beginning to kind of lay the foundation. So not all the readings are going to be like this, you know, don't fret. Um, but if you can chunk it into pieces, into doable segments, and kind of answer these questions as you go along, um, I, I, can, I can bet you that it's going to make at least a little bit more sense by the time you get done. Again, you still may not be a quintillion expert, and that's okay, but... Um, but just so that you have at least kind of, you know, general answers to these seven questions here, you'll, you'll be doing all right. Um, so again, email me or message me if you have uh, any, any questions or need clarification on anything. And uh, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. I'm probably going to go uh, pass out now. Uh, who knows? All right. I will talk to you in cyberspace soon. Bye.